Well, good morning, Mission City Church. How are y'all this morning? Good. It's good to be with you. My name is Brad. This is my first time to be on the North Campus. I've done some Northwest visits and some Central Campus, so it's really good to be with you guys in the North, especially since I have had the privilege of church planting. School gymnasiums have a special place in my heart, so it is in cafeterias. It's good to, good to be with you this morning. This morning, we're going to be picking up where we left off in the book of Genesis. We're going to be in uh, chapter 29 this morning, and as you're turning there, I just want to remind you that there are certain times that if you perceive things incorrectly, they can lead to great disappointment. Have you discovered this? If you perceive things incorrectly, they can lead to great disappointment. So setting our expectations and understanding correctly has a lot to do with how we engage life. I'm the youngest of four boys, dad's high school football coach, and my mom could cook and still can cook in an amazing way. In fact, when I was in elementary school, my friends would ask two questions. They would say, hey, Brad, can I spend the night at your house? And I said, sure, I'll just check with my mama. And they, hey, and would you mind asking her to make this? And so, like, do you even like me or do you just like my mom's cooking? And so uh, there, she could just cook. It was amazing. And, and I can remember that fried chicken was one of the things that she could just nail. I mean, you could walk up to the house and you can smell the fried smell through the door. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you touch the door and you open it and just that wall of fried magic air just comes all over you. Your stomach is growling. Your mouth is salivating. And we're boys, so we're playing all the time. We were hungry. We were ready to go. And I walk into the kitchen and I'm like, let's go. And it turns out to not be fried chicken. It's fried liver. And some of you might not see a problem with that, but there's a big problem with that for me. The amount of expectation hit with a misconception leads to great amounts amounts of disappointment. And we're going to look at that in our story today. I just want to share with you some of the misconceptions that come out about Christianity and especially in our culture, is that if you give your life to Christ, if you do the hard work of owning your sin in his presence and coming to the cross and saying, God, that's what my sin deserves, and if you love like that to do that, then I want you. And if you receive the gift of Christ by faith and you are changed, there's a misconception that oftentimes is told in our culture, and that is the moment after that, life becomes perfect. You become healthy, wealthy, and wise, that there are no more problems or challenges, and God is going to give you an abundance of everything that you want. It's often called the prosperity gospel, and unfortunately, there are many preachers who will preach that. And I want to see some things in our story today that brings that crashing down, but in a most beautiful way to set something up better for us to look at. You ready to look into this? Okay, so we've been following through the book of Genesis and where we've come so far. Last week we looked at Jacob. And if you haven't been with us, let me catch you up on Jacob. He is Isaac's son. He's the second born. And what we've seen with with Jacob so far is he has cheated his older brother out of his first birthright. He traded it for a bowl of soup. He tricked him. Then not only did he trick his brother and get his birthright, but then he tricked his dad and stole the blessing that God had given Abraham, Isaac to pass on. So Jacob, who was the second born, usurped his firstborn brother, took his birthright, took the blessing of the Lord. And as you can imagine, things at the house are not going well. And so his mom says, hey, Jacob, it's probably time for you to go visit your uncle. So she sends him out. And he is going to be leaving to try to save his life after tricking his brother. In fact, the name Jacob does mean usurper, one who grabs the heel. So he's been living a life of trickery. He's gotten all the things he wanted, and now he's got to run for his life. His mom not doesn't send him to his uncle's house. He's also sending him to his uncle for the purpose of getting a wife. I don't want you to marry a Canaanite woman. I need you to marry a woman who has a heart after God. So I want you to go there and I want you to find it. And so as the story goes, Jacob comes into the land of Haran. He runs into some shepherds by a well, finds out if his uncle uh, Laban is still good. He says, yes, he's still good. And while they're talking, up comes Rachel, 
Listen, this is playing like a love story. This is a movie. Here comes Rachel, beautiful hair flowing. She's leading the, shep- uh, the sheep because she's a shepherdess. And they're coming to water and the well. And the next thing you see Jacob do is go, and he walks over to the well. And there's a big stone in front of the well. And as he sees Rachel coming, God gives him some supernatural power to flex in front of her. And he rolls the boulder out of the way and waters all the flocks. And there's this beautiful love story unfolding. And he sees that she is his. And they, they do the Middle Eastern friend kiss to start with, not the romance kiss. And he hugs and he cries and he finds out that things are going well. That goes back to Laban's house with her. And this is playing like a Hallmark film so far. And as they get back there, Jacob is madly in love with Rachel. She's beautiful. She's hardworking. She's everything you want your daughter to be, everything you want your son to marry, Rachel. And so... Turns out Laban says, you can't just stay here and work for me. What what can I give you? He goes, give me Rachel. He says, okay, work for me for seven years, and I'll let you marry Rachel. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies in particular, what Jacob had for Rachel was not a flash in the pan. What Jacob had for Rachel was not a momentary infatuation. He was willing to work seven years for the privilege of marrying her. Now, I'm not saying you need to make all the boys work for seven years for you. What I am saying is one helpful hint, slow down the physical affection. Go slow. You slow down the physical affection, that will weed out 98% of the people God don't want, doesn't want you to marry. So he loved her. He served seven years. And it says in the scripture that it just felt like a day. It just passed like that because he was so madly in love with her. Isn't this a great love story? It's such a great love story. It's amazing. And there's a wedding feast and the wedding's part and the party picks up. It's so great. It's beautiful. Jacob's like, finally, finally, finally. And as they go into the tent together and celebrate their marriage, he wakes up in the morning And it's not Rachel. It's Leah, her older sister, who is not necessarily the most beautiful, attractive human on the planet. It says her eyes were weak, which I translate, she wasn't real good at seeing things, didn't hold her body right, didn't hold her facial expressions right. She was not that attractive. In fact, here's a hint. Her dad had to trick someone into marrying her. What's it feel like to be Rachel? Wakes up in the morning and it's Rachel. Like, how could you do this to me? And all the trickster life that Jacob had been putting on everyone else comes home to roost. Remember the story? What you plant, you will reap. So Jacob has been living a life of uh, usurping and trickstering and changing things. And now Laban does it to him and he wakes up with it in his bed. He says, what do you do? And he goes, well, finish your week of honeymoon with her. And then I'll give you Rachel. Anyone seeing a recipe for disaster developing here? So he finishes the honeymoon with her, then marries Rachel right after that, and works another seven years. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. Because as we pick up this story, we're going to find that Rachel is not at all loved. What we're going to see in this story Two really big things we want to look at before we get into verse 31. The first thing I want to look at is we need to understand in this story what God is showing us that he does not see things the way people see things. Remember the Samuel, the prophet, came to Jesse's house to find the first king of Israel and he sees Jesse's firstborn, just a specimen of a man. And he looks at that guy and goes, that's got to be him. And God whispers into Samuel's heart. He goes, do not look at his appearance. For I've rejected him. See, God does not look as man looks. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. I want you to understand that our God sees things different than we do. And the reason God sees things different than we do is because there was a point in time where humanity decided to do things on their own apart from God. And one of the consequences of us saying, God, mind your own business, we're going to take over things from now on. One of those things is that we don't see like we're supposed to see. 
Do not see on the outward appearance, but look at the heart. So if God sees things a certain way and humans see things a certain way, can you tell me which one is the right way to look? It's going to be God's way. And I want us to understand this so that we can realize that if if this is God's way of looking at it and this is not God's way of looking at it, who do you think is in charge of this system? Yeah, it's Satan. It is the evil one who teaches us to look at appearance. It is the evil one who tells us if someone is physically attractive according to our culture, they should get more praise than someone who is not. It is the evil system that says if someone is a better athlete, they should get more love and respect than someone who is not. Someone who is rich than someone who is poor. Do you understand? And there is this social pecking order in this fallen nature of humanity. And Rachel is being a victim of this fallen pecking order. She's not pretty, or you can put in there whatever the social pecking is. She's not smart enough. She's not good enough. She's not athletic enough. Whatever that system is. And I want to share with you that that system that is ruled by the enemy of God, the enemy of your soul, is the system you and I were raised in. We judge by appearance, by default. But I want you to understand in 1 Corinthians 1, God is doing something. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul tells us, God has chosen the foolish to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak to shame the strong. What's God doing? God has chosen the base things, the things that are not. God, on purpose, is choosing the lowest strata of the social pecking order. Who was invited to Jesus' birthday party? Who did the angels show up to to say, hey, the Savior of the world just showed up. Would you please come and celebrate this with me? Who did he show up to? Do you know what a shepherd is? The thing your parents said you would be if you didn't do your homework. They were the bottom of the pecking order. 1 Corinthians 1 is telling us God has chosen the things that are not in order to nullify or bring to nothing the things that are. I want you to understand that what we're seeing in this story where this heartache is coming from is a fallen world system where men judge by appearance And that's why Jesus said in John 7, do not judge by appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Which then means if we are judging by appearance, by default, that's not righteous. And that is how the enemy has brought so much heartache and brokenness in our world. Because we buy his system hook, line, and sinker. And we start gauging other people, not as an image bearer of the living God, purchased by the blood of my Savior, worthy of love and respect. We go, I don't know, are you pretty enough? Are you smart enough? Are you cool enough? Are you this enough? And we begin to stratify that. That is not God's heart. God is actually destroying that system to bring another one. And if God is destroying that system to bring another one, and we belong to him, My friends, what should we be doing? Ladies, your value is not in your appearance. You're an absolute treasure because the God of heaven knit you together in your mother's womb, bought you with the precious blood of his son. Gentlemen, you are not better because you make more money or you're better at this event or because of the athleticism or anything else in the strata where we fall in and try to find our value. No, you matter because the God of heaven made you on purpose, for a purpose, for himself. And until we believe this about ourselves and then treat humanity the same way, way, then we're going to propagate this fallen world system. And it's broken my heart. I've done years of youth ministry, years of pastoring. It breaks my heart when I step into a church and I see the same social pecking order of high school with adults in the church. But I'll also share with you, when I step into a church and this social pecking order is shot, 
And it doesn't matter how much money you make or what car you drive. They are brothers and sisters and they love each other and there is a respect. What I've seen God do with that group of people is transform an entire city and a culture. I want you to see that. Because that's part of what causes this trouble. Uh, Ladies, a free one for you. Beauty is pointless. Proverbs 31. Charm is lying manipulation, but a woman who fears the Lord, whew, whew, brother, slow it down. Okay? All right. So, what we have here is Leah suffering because she's not pretty enough, she's not cool enough. Now, she has to be the second wife, even though she was the first wife, to the one that he loves. Jacob loves Rachel. For seven years, I will work to get Rachel. I adore... What is this thing? You are the tricking deception. You are my treasure. Second thing we're going to (coughs) see is that the God of the universe is destroying that system. And that's why the rest of this story is not going to be about Rachel. The rest of this story is going to be about Leah. And the rest of this story is going to be about us. Because every one of us has fallen short in some part of this world system. Every one of us has had people who are supposed to fulfill a role that God appointed to them in their life who have failed us. Jacob's job was to love Leah. And he totally failed. Some of you have had parents whose jobs were to show you love and kindness and respect, and they failed you. Some of you know the pain and the heartache of having friends you thought were friends only to find that they betrayed you or a spouse. The rest of this story is for us who are victims of a fallen world system and victims of where people should have been loving us, and every one of us has been wounded at some level. And this story is for us. How do we handle when we don't measure up and when people let us down? And listen, I thought following Christ made my life better, but I've given my life to Christ and things are getting worse. How do I walk through this? I've just buried a child. How do I walk through this, God? This is what we're going to see. So let's take a look at Leah's longing for love. If you're following along, let's jump in at verse 31 to our story. Excuse me. And here's what it says in verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Can you see the echo of God choosing the low? See this happening? First thing I want to share with you, my friends, if you're willing to embrace the brokenness that comes in this fallen world, not put dirt on it. If you're willing to walk through this and let God have access to it, he's going to do amazing things inside of us, bring healing and power to make us strong enough to love other people and destroy the social pecking order while bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And the first thing that you want to say here this morning, the first thing God wants to say is, I see you. God says, I see you. When God saw that Rachel was not loved. When God saw that she was hated, God moved in love. He opened her womb. She had a son, verse 32, and Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, which means see a son. So she sees that God sees her. She understands that. She's enjoying the blessing of God by having a son. And she even names him, God sees me. See a son. But here's what she says. Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Verse 33. And again, she conceived and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I was hated. He's given me this son also. I just want you to understand that our God is not a God that when you go through hard times is somehow vacant. The scripture actually says that God draws near to the brokenhearted. 
So when you're hurt and when you're wounded and when your legs get swept out from underneath you, which is going to happen? I love all of Jesus' promises except one. In this world, you will have trouble. I don't like that one. I like where he goes with it. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You will have trouble. Your legs are going to get swept out. People are going to fail you. Life is going to get worse. Everyone you know is going to eventually be in a cemetery. Life is going to get hard. And you need to understand that God hears you, God sees you, and when you're walking through the stress and the trials of life, God is not distant, he draws near. The very hairs of your head are numbered, and God is not into fashion of your hair. What he's saying is, I know you. Like, I know you in and out. And I want to bless you. I want to give you the things that you long for and the things that you need. So, she names him. <clears throat> she names him Simeon, which sounds like the word heard in Hebrew. Verse 34, and again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, she named him Levi, which means attached. So do you see this pattern happening? She is hurt, she is broken, she is wounded. God sees her, he hears her, he's trying to attach her to himself. So he gives her the desire of her heart. Three sons. He sees me, he hears me, he attaches me. But what does she do with all three of those gifts that God gave her? And this is what we need to see in our woundedness and in our brokenness. What happens to us as people is our loves get out of order. I think all of us have known females who have grown up without a father showing the love and affirmation and affection, and they struggle sometimes with healthy relationships with males because their loves get out of order. Or young men who weren't necessarily accepted by their dads or cared for, and so they're proving something and they become workaholics to get up to a status that can, their loves are out of order. And what happens to us when we're wounded, and we're all wounded, is our loves get out of place. And this is hugely important because our loves are what drive our lives. With my love for my wife gets out of order with my love for another woman, what do you call that? It's adultery. If my love for God gets out of order with love for something else, what do you call that? Idolatry. Because loving something more than you love God is the same as loving some woman other than your wife. It's personal to God. It's idolatry with God. And what you see in a wounded Leah is the same thing you see in a wounded you and me. Our loves get out of order because our desires aren't met and everything gets discombobulated. And so she's taking, God, thank you for seeing me. God, thank you for hearing me. Thank you for trying to attach me to yourself. Thank you for these children. I'm going to use this to go get my husband's affection. And we end up taking the blessings that God gives us and then we try to use those to get what we really want. We try to take the things that God abundantly pours into our life because he loves us, and we try to go over here and get something. And as much as I want to change the world by sharing the gospel with people and seeing them move from death to life and to know Jesus as their Savior and their friend, to be born again, to be new creations, to exist in a whole new life, to help bring heaven to earth, to build Christ's kingdom and destroy Satan's kingdom, as much as I want to see that, it is a real temptation to take the blessings that God gives us and to use them to satisfy wounded places inside of us. And you see it happen everywhere around you all day long. Maybe even in your own heart, if you're honest. 
And finally it dawned on Leah. I'm not going to take God's drawing of me and loving of me and blessing of me and try to get something as much as I want to change this world system. This world system is never going to change until Christ returns. We can change people's hearts. We can even change societies and cultures. But that social pecking order is going to stay around. And that person's heart may never change. That dad may never repent. We all come from broken places. And we try to feel the pain of affliction in a variety of ways. And we're looking for what our souls desperately need on a horizontal plane. But if you haven't figured it out yet, nothing on a horizontal plane can fill the eternity that God put inside the hearts of men and women. And after three, it dawns on Leah what's going on. Look at me with verse, look at verse 35 with me. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah, which sounds like praise, and she ceased conceiving. After three times of going, thank you, God, for drawing near. Thank you for blessing me. Now my husband might love me. Now my husband might hear me. Now my husband might see me. Now he... Finally, she goes, actually, I was made for you first and him second. My whole existence is to be the object of your love and affection, Almighty God. And my whole purpose, as Jesus told us, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. When we realize what is first must be first, but not only what first must be first, when first is first, First is so powerful. God is so full. Life with him is so abundant. Jesus said, whoever comes to me and believes, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He didn't say you'd have a water fountain. He said rivers would flow out of you. What Leah realized is, this is an empty whale. well. This is a broken cistern. This water fountain doesn't have any water in it. But right here, I have the abundance of God's love in whose presence is fullness of joy. In whose presence pleasures are in his right hand forevermore. You are everything I was created to exist, be a part of. You alone can fill the eternity in my heart. And Leah finally realizes you drawing near and hearing me and seeing me and attaching me to you is more than enough. I'm not settling. I am overflowing because it's you, God, that I need. Have you gotten there? Have you gotten there? Or are you still looking on the horizontal? for the things in this broken world to give you what you need. Can I encourage you to, to stop? Can I encourage you to see this fallen, broken world system the way God does? And to begin to look at people the way God does so you can start bringing his kingdom on earth by the way you love people and treat people? tear down the social pecking order, and when you and I are broken and when we see other people who are broken, can I encourage you? Don't take the fact that God sees you and hears you and knows you and blesses you to try to exchange it for something cheap. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Because God is everything. He's first, he's full, and he's abundant. End of the chapter. But not the end of the story. What's God going to do with Judah? You're going to see it in chapter 49. 
when he says this prophecy that the ruler's staff will not depart between Judah's feet until Shiloh comes, the one to whom it belongs, and to him will be the obedience of the nations. Guess through whom the Savior of the world is going to come. It's not Rachel. It's Leah. And it's not Reuben or Simeon or Levi. It's Judah. What will God do through the lives of men and women who snap out of a fallen world system, put first things first, and are satisfied with him so much that even the broken emptiness of this world cannot drain you because you have rivers of living water because the king of glory lives inside of you. And so if you're here and you don't know the gospel, let me just share something with you. The gospel just means good news. Can I tell you what is going on here in this whole narrative God's giving us? God made you on purpose because he's crazy about you. You are created with more honor and more dignity and more value than any stratified social pecking order could ever give you. This is pathetic compared to the real value the God of the universe has for you. And he demonstrated this because though we were made to be like God in order to be intimate with God, we sinned. And became unlike him and separated from him. And sin requires death. So Jesus says, send me, Dad. I'm going. And Jesus came, who is God from eternity past, to be born inside of a woman into a barn to have little shepherds come to his birthday party. To go from that little barn manger to live a perfect life where all humanity should have said, this is what we're created to do and be. And instead of humanity loving and adoring him, God's plan was for Jesus to be the sacrifice for our sin. It was in a garden on a Thursday night when Jesus is praying, Father, if there is another way, can we do this? And the father says to him, my son, I love you. There's no other way. Then let's do what you want. But father, if there is another way, can we do this? Because I don't want to drink what you're going to have me drink. I love you, my son. There's no other way than what you want, father. Let's do it. But if there's another way, please, I don't want to take the wrath for every sin ever committed in my own body, not metaphorically, literally. I don't want to drink the cup of justice. So if there is another way, Father, would you please, let's do it a different way. My son, I love you. There is no other way. If you don't drink it, they will have to. And Jesus said, never let them drink it, give it to me. I'll take it. And he goes to a cross and he takes the wrath of God for every sin committed on the planet from beginning to end in his own body and God destroys his own son on a cross because he loves us. And after Christ sacrificed to pay our sin, three days later, rise out of the grave and says, that makes me king of kings. Now I can not only forgive every single person who comes to me, but I can cause you to be a new creation and start life over again. This is the gospel, that if any person realizes their sin against God and believes Christ, they can receive him by faith and be forgiven of everything. And receive the gift of Christ inside rivers of living water. Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness, God. Thank you for the story of Rachel and Leah. Thank you for showing us that you and your kingdom are different than what we were raised in. You're so different, God. You are good. You are righteous. You are holy. And all of us have been broken by this fallen world. And even our own sinful choices, we have let our loves get out of line. This morning, if you're here and you've never received Jesus by faith, 
I want to encourage you, if you believe the story, if you know it's true in your heart, then understand that God loves you and is calling you to himself. He sees you this morning. He sees you. He hears you. And he's trying to attach you to himself. You are mine. Come and be forgiven. Come and confess your sin. Stop trying to satisfy yourself on this horizontal plane with things that can never satisfy. That only distort your loves, which then distort your life, which continues the brokenness. Come to the one who is first. And receive the forgiveness that you need. If that's you this morning, you receive Jesus simply by believing him. You believe him and you say, Jesus, I believe your love for me. I believe your sacrifice for me. Would you forgive my sin? Would you draw me to you and would you come live inside me? Make me yours and help me figure out what all this means. If that's you this morning, there's people who want to pray with you and celebrate that and talk with you. Find one of us afterwards. Believer. It's time for you to name the struggle in your life, Judah. It's time for you to stop looking to second things to be first. And to come to the one who is first find the healing and the forgiveness and the wholeness and the love and the affirmation that you were created to have from him so that all the things in second place don't derail you anymore would you come and let Christ fill you thank you for your goodness Christ it's in your name we pray amen Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Go to missioncity.church and learn more. I also wanna encourage you to worship through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.